All right. Well, thanks for coming back. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces that were here when I gave a talk earlier. Uh, again, my name is Drew Mosley. I'm uh, with Mender.io, uh, and we are an open source project for deploying over-the-air updates. Uh, I, I'm guessing uh, this talk is going to be uh, primarily about the, the uh, key considerations in designing an update uh, strategy and an update system. I'm guessing based on some of the questions and content earlier, uh, discussions we had after my previous talk, there will be uh, hopefully a, a lot of questions. Uh, generally, this uh, talk is uh, more of a 45-minute talk, and it starts with a lot of general stuff, but I'm thinking uh, the folks here probably don't need all the details, so I'll kind of try to blast through some of the uh, initial slides here and get uh, more into the meat, uh, talking about actual updating strategies strategies and that kind of thing. Uh, so if I'm going too, too fast for something here on the initial uh, couple slides, you know, feel free to speak up, raise your hand, get my attention, and I'll be happy to slow down. Um, but uh, in, in before we des started designing our product, uh, we did a lot of interviews with embedded developers, and we were specifically took targeting the embedded market uh, for, for this updater. So at the time these, these slides were put together, it was about 30 interviews, and I, I know it's more than that now, but I don't, I don't know how much uh, further we've gotten. Uh, talk a, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what's uh, unique about in, uh, updates in the embedded market. Uh, based on the discussions earlier about the number of folks that are doing embedded connected devices, it's probably not going to be nothing uh, too surprising in there. Uh, and then, we'll, then we will dig into some of the uh, actual strategies and uh, design decisions you need to make when you're doing a, an update. Um, like I say, here's all my contact information. It'll also be at the end uh, of the presentation. Uh, if I, you know, we don't get a chance to uh, answer your questions here, feel free to reach out to me, uh, and I'll be happy to chat with anybody uh, over email or Twitter or whatever. Uh, I, I, this is one of those slides that we always put in, uh, especially when we're dealing uh, with uh, less technical folks and, and more marketing-focused uh, folks. I don't think there's any, any, any big surprises here. Uh, the net is there will be bugs in your code after you deploy it to the field, and you've got to be able to fix it. And uh, the two primary... Uh, design decisions that we went into our uh, product design are that the updater has to be robust and it has to be secure. And I'll uh, get into a little bit of that uh, in the next couple of slides on what that means. Uh, but uh, just keep in mind that that was our, our number one design uh, decision. No, any decisions we made, if it reduced the robustness or security, uh, that we won't do that in our product. And, and for embedded, we feel that's the right way to do it. Obviously, things like secure communication, uh, cryptographic uh, signatures, that kind of thing, uh, those are all, all, all required uh, for, for any, uh, any, any real system today. And in a lot of cases, a lot of the folks we talked to did their own homegrown system. Uh, some people here mentioned doing that. Um, and, and there are plenty of projects out there that you can use. Uh, many of the homegrown systems we've seen get put in very late in, the, in, in their uh, design cycle and corners get cut. Robustness and security are, are you know, done as, a, as, as an afterthought. So homegrown may or may not be the right thing for you. Uh, of course, I guess if you're attending a, a conference like this, you're probably thinking about those things ahead of time. So it's probably less of an issue. Uh, I think these numbers here that came out of our survey, they, they kind of jive pretty closely to, to what we did, uh, the, the, the conversation earlier. Uh, in this uh, audience, I'm kind of curious, how many people that, that have uh, systems in the field have uh, a means to deploy updates to them automatically? Okay, and how many have updates that are not automatic? Okay, so a few more not automatic than, than automatic, but uh, it, 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 that's another criteria that we'll get into is it has to be automatic and, and simple. Um, the, the primary mechanism, especially in the embedded space for updaters, is what's called the dual AB root file system. And that's basically you have two root file systems that your bootloader chooses uh, at boot time. Uh, other options are package based, which is your typical desktop distribution, apt-get, or uh, yum type updates. Um, and, uh, and then there's other uh, less, less uh, formalized ones. We've heard of people doing weird things with tarballs and all sorts of kind of crazy things that are hard to track in the long run. Um, 
and and this is more uh, this slide like I said is more uh, for those that are um, developing their own typically it's a three to six month effort a lot of customers we've talked to they think they're just gonna slap together an updater in one to two weeks and they find out that it uh, <laughs> there's a lot of details they hadn't considered um, and th another thing you might want to consider uh, is how frequently are you updating are you rolling out you know continual updates or is it just when there's a CVE you have to address uh, you know we've uh, we've talked to some customers that uh, gave up on a updating the base OS and decided they would just update their content files because uh, they just assumed the base OS would be sound. Uh, bottom line, uh, most, uh, most connected devices these days aren't uh, where they need to be as far as deploying updates. Uh, however, uh, given the uh, early, early stage of the industry for most of this, most of them are not that far behind the average. Uh, we definitely see an increase in uh, interest in, in over-the-air updates. Uh, most of the conferences we go to, we definitely see more, uh, more discussion around it. So uh, that, that's all promising news. Uh, and obviously, the, co the connectivity and the sheer large number of uh, connected embedded devices is a, is a large driver towards this. So, uh, for those that aren't in the embedded space, just a couple uh, things to consider uh, that, that, that may drive the decisions uh, around an update or specifically targeting embedded. Uh, in a lot, depending on your use case, uh, they, the devices may be remote, might be hard to get to. Uh, they might have uh, unreliable power if they're running on battery. They might have unreliable uh, network connectivity. Uh, a lot of these devices don't even have Wi-Fi. They might have 3G or something like that, which is a fairly expensive uh, means to download uh, over-the-air updates. So there's a lot of different kinds of things that need to be considered uh, you know, when you're dealing with uh, this environment as opposed to a, a data center enterprise type environment. Um, and you know, there, 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 of course, are lots of things that can go wrong. So as I mentioned, robustness and security, top priority number one. All right. Beyond that, you see the other ca characteristics that we looked at. How easy is it to integrate with your existing workflow? How easy is it to get started? Uh, and then uh, bandwidth consumption and downtime. Uh, those are those are important for the end users, but as far as actually getting started with the over-the-air updates, the first uh, three items on this list are really more uh, for, for the, the system designers. So when it comes to robustness and security, what we mean by this is uh, robustness is that you can never brick the device. If I download an update, it is installed all the way or it's not installed at all. Nothing except for the updater client ever sees a partially installed update. If there's an issue with power, if there's an issue with network connectivity, if there's some kind of corruption in the image, that's all handled by the client uh, the, and the, the actual system will never run in that, in that state. Um, the, 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 in this case, the updates are always atomic. They have to be. Uh, the, there's, you know, you, with the dual AB root file system, that's the reason we chose that uh, primarily was to allow that atomic in, update, right? If you're doing a package-based update, all bets are off. You don't know, you, you don't really know what the state of any given device is without uh, a lot of Herculean efforts. Um, the nice thing from the development perspective is this allows very consistent uh, deployments of, uh, of images. You know exactly what's on the device and it should be exactly what you tested in the lab. Uh, you have a single binary that gets that runs through your QA and that's the same binary that gets installed out on your device in the field. Um, and then additional checks, sanity checks after update. Our, our system by default um, on reboot, if the system is unable to connect to the server, it assumes a failure. And in that case, it will automatically roll back to the previous uh, to the previous installation. We, there are also additional uh, mechanisms to do additional checks. So your your particular design uh, or use case may have additional things it wants to check. It might want to check some database uh, you know database sanity or uh, you know maybe a, a migration of uh, some some data files was done properly. So you know ideally there'd be a, a mechanism to do plugins on after the boot to be able to say is this a sane update or not. Obviously the updater itself handles the generic uh, characteristics of can I connect back to the server? Does it look like the system is up and running? But uh, in terms of the actual specific use case, uh, that's generally up to the system designer that's that's integrating the uh, the uh, updater system. 
Uh, and then the, the final thing, of course, is ensuring the authenticity of the update. That's where the cryptographic checksums come in. Uh, you know, you use TLS to verify that uh, you're talking to the right server, and then you uh, have an additional check based on cryptographic uh, identi identification of the images before you install them, just to make sure that uh, you aren't installing the wrong thing. There was an incident uh, a couple months ago with uh, some, uh, some embedded uh, door locks that were used by Airbnb and a number of other customers and they had some issues where the wrong firmware update was installed and it was for I believe an ARM v5 and it got installed on an ARM v6 or something like that uh, so and the the lock was completely bricked at that point um, so you know you've got to be able to ensure the authenticity you've got to be able to ensure that the target uh, the artifact is targeted at the specific device so there's a number of checks you want to do um, and you you always want to uh, ensure that another update can be done. You always want to have a known good rollback. Uh, so that's, you know, in the most generic terms. Um, in terms of integrating with existing environments, everybody's starting with uh, a lot of history. Uh, you, have a, you have a number of uh, existing tools, you have hardware, that kind of thing. So uh, ideally, if there is a, a third party updater you're looking to go with, uh, that it, there are means for it to integrate into the, to the environment that you're using. Um, in, in our case, we're a Yoc primarily Yocto based, there's nothing uh, inherent in our design that it, that requires Yocto. That's just the low-hanging fruit that we've chosen. Um, and, uh, you know, at some point we hope to be able to, to branch out from that. Um, and then, of course, one one thing to consider is do you have devices in the field that have nothing installed that you want to install the updater on? And the, we've got a, a slide about mechanisms to do that. That's a, a lot trickier because typically these updaters will uh, require partition updated partition structures and that kind of thing. And that's uh, virtually impossible to do uh, in a robust fashion when uh, the devices are remote and you don't have uh, physical hands-on access to them. Uh, another uh, another nice feature is is there a standalone mode or is there significant uh, backend management infrastructure that's uh, associated with the updater? Um, we we provide both a client and a backend management server, uh, but it's possible to use a lot of these updaters just as a client running on the device, and then you write some custom scripting around it. If your needs are fairly modest, you don't necessarily want to set up uh, a management uh, web backend to manage a large fleet of devices. For instance, you might just have a few small devices uh, that you. You can uh, throw together some bash scripts and uh, you know just use the the, the client in a, in a standalone mode uh, invoking the client directly on your target device uh, and then you know how extensible is it I mentioned uh, the ability to plug in your particular use cases uh, and do uh, sanity checks and that kind of thing based on your particular use case and uh, how easy is it to get started? Is the documentation good? Uh, do you feel that it's uh, well tested? Again, these are these are more of the uh, non-functional requirements. So I'll, we'll we'll move forward. Uh, and as far as your end users, bandwidth and downtime obviously are a big concern. Uh, if it uh, eats up a lot of 3G data, that can get expensive. Uh, if it takes 20 minutes to reboot into the new image, obviously our uh, end users don't want that. So uh, a couple of things to uh, to keep in mind when you're considering uh, how how you might want to integrate an update system into your environment. So let's uh, dig in a bit to some of the specific strategies. Uh, installer strategy number one, this is kind of the one I, was, I mentioned a minute ago, where you have a system already in the field, and you might want to uh, make it, while it's deployed, somehow available for updates. Um, and this is just an updater client that runs on the target uh, and, and, and does some level of updates. Robustness, robustness is difficult here. Uh, obviously, if you have to manipulate the uh, partition structures, that's a bad idea. So uh, it's very difficult to get a robust setup in this environment. Similar with atomicity, uh, it's not impossible, but uh, it does require uh, some extra extra steps to make sure that uh, your, your installations are still maintained as atomic. Obviously, it will integrate very well into an existing system. It's generally just a, a client executable of some kind that would install into your running system. Uh, typically, it's low bandwidth use, although uh, I guess that depends on exactly how much data you're installing with it. Uh, and usually the, the downtime is fairly short. The, the systems can usually stay up and running while the updates are going on in the background. And once the updates are complete, then the system can do the reboot if needed. 
another strategy uh, that could get similar results is booting into a maintain maintenance mode, uh, where basically you have a, a small root file system that you boot that handles any updates. Um, this can th this is uh, the biggest issue on this is the long downtime. Your system is up, you have to reboot uh, into your maintenance mode, which then does your update, and then it reboots back into the system mode. Uh, additionally, there could be extra reboots if there are fail uh, if there are failures in the sanity checks after booting the update, then you would have to reboot, reinstall the original uh, in rollback. So rollback uh, d does potentially add quite a bit of time uh, to, to your system here. Uh, and, and bandwidth, obviously, it's fairly high because you are downloading uh, an entire image. Uh, there are mechanisms to minimize that using delta updates and that kind of thing, but uh, it can still, it can still slow, slow things way down. And this is the one that I that I mentioned specifically for us uh, that we're using, and, and I know I've spoken with at least a couple of folks here that use this. Uh, the the big downside of having two root file systems is that uh, it, uh, it it cuts down your storage quite significantly. You have to create obviously two partitions in your storage space. Uh, the way the way flash sizes and disk sizes are going, that's less of an issue, but uh, there are certainly still uh, markets where this becomes uh, problematic. Uh, it, the some of the advantages here, it is robust, fully atomic, uh, fully consistent. Uh, the assumption here is that, that all the logic to select whether it's A or B is handled in the bootloader uh, so that you are able to update new kernels and root file systems. That has the implication that you're not updating the bootloader in the field, but uh, that's a pretty standard architecture. And, and uh, generally speaking, bootloaders are small enough that that shouldn't be too uh, big of an inconvenience. It, it, it integrates fairly well, but there's usually some you know additional partitioning that needs to be done and that kind of thing. Uh, again, it can have the high bandwidth use, but the biggest thing is it can have a, a very short download time. The, the, the new image can download and be written to the storage uh, without interrupting the end user, and when it's time uh, for, to boot into the new image, then simply simply reboot, and the, the user has to deal with a, a, a single reboot time or two if, they're, if we need to roll back, uh, because roll back at that point is simply switching back over to the previous one that was known good before. And I'll, I'll mention this one just briefly. I'm not sure that it's terribly appropriate in the embedded Linux space. Uh, the idea is that you've got an external system that acts as a gateway to deploy images. Uh, this is typically used for smaller systems running embedded, embedded operating systems, sensors, uh, actuators, that kind of thing. Uh, there, may be, there may be some uh, use for this uh, where embedded Linux is running on the target devices, but that's not something that we've uh, seen a whole lot. And obviously, uh, the ability to, to manage the deployments, that's another thing you've got to decide if, if it's relevant for your use case. Do you need a web infrastructure to maintain your device fleet, or is some kind of scripting on the device uh, simple, simple enough in your case? So with that, I think we've got enough, uh, a, a few minutes for some questions, and I will open the floor to anybody that has questions. One second for the microphone, and I'm not working now either. Yes. So with our device, how do you deal with user data? It's on the machine and you update the current partition to the new version, and then you roll back the old version of the, the new format of the user data. 
sure. So the so the question is, how do you deal with user data specifically in the in the case of a rollback, right? So the idea being, I, I install a new image, uh, maybe it does a database migration or something to a newer format, and then I decide I have to rollback. That's going to have to be done by the plugin architecture. That can't be obviously can't be done in any generic fashion uh, because the updater itself won't necessarily know. But if the you know if you've got a plugin that can come in and, and do some kind of post installation uh, migration to some new format or something, then there would also have to be a, a callback that says, okay, uh, we're rolling back. You need to undo whatever you've already done. And in, in, in general, I, I can speak for, for, for our updater, our default partition structure, we have the A and the B root file systems, but we also have a persistent data partition. So, the, the, so that is not touched on any given update. So you know, there is definitely a place to store that, that data, but it, the, the manipulation of that data obviously has to be handled very carefully. Okay, okay, very good. Any other questions? In the back. Right. So the question is, uh, you know, what about things like uh, ButterFS or NixOS that use uh, various techniques to, uh, to 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 not require that dual partition, but still get the uh, atomic and uh, robust guarantees that you get with the dual partition? And I can say definitely, we have looked at it. Uh, it's not something we've implemented today, but it is. Uh, uh, you know, it's a, there's obviously more work involved in that. The dual AB is fairly well understood, so we picked that as you know, from from our particular project perspective. We picked that as the, the low-hanging fruit, but uh, we are certainly considering those things. Uh, and, you know, I, I'd love to, to pick your brain about it later. You see, you've probably looked into it a little bit more than I have. Uh, I've, uh, I've only, you know, touched it at the very surface level to understand that it's feasible, but that's about as far as I've, I personally have gotten with it. Okay. Yes? Okay, so the, the, the question is, if an update fails multiple times and you attempt to write a bad update numerous times, will that affect the, uh, the lifetime of the flash? Is that... Uh, and, and, it, and it most certainly will. Uh, and that's, you know, a design decision. Uh, in, in, in our case, if an update fails, it's not going to try to reinstall it. Uh, at that point, you know, the update has failed. It requires operator intervention to figure out what to do next. Uh, if it was just some, some glitch in writing the flash, you know, and, and we just say, yeah, go ahead and do it again. That's fine. But a, an operator would need to intervene uh, to, 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 to do that. Yeah, we, we don't ever have any automatic reinstallation after a fail. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, can I mitigate with what? Yes, precisely. Uh, the, the question was uh, on the slide, uh, on this slide here, the, the asterisks ne next to the high bandwidth use. Um, yes, the, the, you know, can that be mitigated with things like Delta updates? And absolutely it can. And, and that's, uh, uh, for, speaking from my project specifically, that, that, that's a feature that we are working on. Everybody we talk to, that's one of the first questions they ask. So we definitely want that feature out quickly. Uh, I know Leonard's given a talk on CA Sync. That was one of the options that, that we're considering. Uh, and I know there are quite a few options out there. Uh, it's it's kind of a tricky thing to get right, uh, you know, because if you decide that you require the the A and B to be read-only root file systems, in some ways that makes it simpler because then I can do the, the delta calculations on the server based on the image that we know was installed, whereas if the, the A and the B root file system are read-write, then I have to ha have some kind of mechanism where the calculation is done on the device since the data may have changed and we don't know what it is. Correct. That would only ha help with the bandwidth use. Something like ButterFS or, or some of those other uh, techniques uh, w could potentially help with some kind of it's some kind of an overlay structure uh, in the file system that would that would help mitigate the uh, extra need of multiple partitions. Yes. So after applying an update, uh, I guess you do some different hash checks. Do you do additional checks when booting up the update? So is there a rollback? Is there a potential rollback uh, 
once you boot up the new system. Yeah, so the question is, where are the checks done? So there are checks done before we boot, so that would be the cryptographic checksums and things like that, and then there are checks done after we boot. Uh, our generic setup is, does the system come up far enough for our client executable get running and be able to communicate back to the server? That's the minimum step we can do uh, on the reboot. And then, then the, the, in our case, there's a plug-in architecture uh, where you could plug in additional executables that uh, that verify sanity and other means that, that that are specific to you. All right, time is up. Thank you very much.